I'm happy to announce that these brand new hand wrappers are finally here and ready for use. After months of dedicated work, I have created a finished product and have several of them prepared for shipment. Before we dive in, I want to emphasize that this video is very comprehensive. If you're considering purchasing a wrapping jig from me, I encourage you to watch the entire video. Transparency is the key, and I believe that knowing exactly what you're buying beforehand is beneficial for both of us. As a creator, my reputation is at stake with every product I send out. Most people discover me and my work through word of mouth, so I value the satisfaction of my customers greatly. By providing a thorough understanding of the pros and cons, the assembly instructions, and the intricacies of this jig design and usage, I aim to ensure your complete satisfaction. To begin, I'll address what I consider the two main considerations or potential drawbacks that you might want to be aware of before purchasing one of my hand wrappers. After that, we'll explore the benefits and reasons why you might want to invest in one. Then I'll delve into each component of the jig and explain their functions and proper usage. And if you're still here and interested in purchasing a jig after that demonstration, I'll provide information on where you can make your purchases and the expected turnaround time for shipping. Before we proceed, I have a couple of important notes. First, please refrain from modifying this jig. The parts are 3D printed and not suitable for drilling new holes or attachments due to their mostly hollow interior structure. Also, modifying the jig could weaken or even break the parts. Additionally, it's crucial to avoid exposing the 3D printed components to acetone or other harsh solvents. With that being said, let's dive right in. Here are the cons, or why you might hesitate to buy these hand wrapping jigs. First is the exclusion of the metal rails. The jigs do not come with the metal rails that determine the overall length. The rails are made of inexpensive half inch EMT conduit. You'll need to source the rails from a local home improvement or hardware store. While this may initially seem inconvenient, there are actually valid reasons behind this decision. By not including the metal rails, the cost of the jigs is significantly reduced for everyone, including myself. Shipping expenses, material cost, and the time required for sourcing and cleaning and cutting and deburring each rail would drive up the overall price of the jigs. Additionally, shipping the jigs without the metal rails allows me to utilize free USPS priority mailboxes that are shipped to my home at no cost to me. The free boxes help me keep the product cost down. This approach also gives customers full control over the length of their hand wrapping jig. It allows them to customize it to their individual preferences. For example, if you primarily build multi-piece fly rods, you may prefer a shorter jig for storage and convenience. At the time of making this video, my local Home Depot offers five foot lengths of one half inch EMT conduit for less than $5 each. One of those pieces could be cut into three 20 inch long pieces, which would result in a 20 inch wrapper with an additional cost of around $5. On the other hand, if you build longer one piece surf rods, you can opt for 10 foot long pieces of EMT conduit, which are available for less than $7 each at my local Home Depot at the time I'm making this video. Purchasing three of these would enable you to create a 10 foot long jig at a total cost of approximately $21 for the conduit. And later on in this video, I'll discuss the process of working with EMT conduit and offering some useful tips on cutting and cleaning it. So even if you need to buy a tubing cutter with prices ranging from about $6 up, you can find them at Harbor Freight for about $6 and they work perfectly fine. I actually own one of these. So if you buy a tubing cutter for $6 and then the additional cost of the EMT conduit, you're looking at a cost of anywhere from about $11 to $21 for enough conduit to make a wrapping jig anywhere from 20 inches long to 10 foot long. And in my opinion, those costs are quite reasonable. The second biggest con would be the trust factor. As a YouTube creator, I understand that it's natural for you to question whether you can trust me as a seller or not. I genuinely appreciate your concerns and I take them seriously. I've been creating YouTube videos since 2016. In 2018, I designed my first hand wrapper and decided to start selling those. 
I sold over 300 of my original hand wrappers on eBay and I only had one return. In that particular case, the customer mentioned that they were unable to wrap with the jig, but I didn't receive any further details despite my attempts to inquire. Of course, I issued a refund. I value my reputation. I strive to rectify any problems. Should any problems arise with your purchase, I am committed to making things right and addressing any concerns you may have. Your satisfaction and trust are extremely important to me. If something does go wrong, I will do my best to resolve that situation and try to learn from it. Whether it requires me revising a part or making some other sort of improvements for the future, I'll do those things if necessary. Your feedback is valuable to me and I consider it an opportunity to enhance my products. Here are the pros or why you would want to buy this jig. First and foremost, it's important to clarify that no hand wrapper will magically make you a more talented rod builder. Building a rod with just a spool of thread and a coffee cup and a rod blank sitting on your lap is technically possible, but it would be time consuming and not very enjoyable for me. However, a well-designed hand wrapper can significantly simplify the rod building process. I genuinely believe that the hand wrapper I've designed is not only easier to use, but can also help you achieve more consistent results compared to other commercially available jigs that are currently on the market. I've incorporated built-in features that make various rod building tasks easier to complete. Number two, there are visual aids for guide alignment. My jig has two visual aids that assist with guide alignment. The center metal rod serves as a visual aid from above the rod looking down, while the rod blank supports themselves have a thin line that runs down the center of the blank support, acting as a visual guide for alignment when viewing the guides from the front or the rear side of the rod. While I still recommend performing a final visual check in making any necessary adjustments while holding the rod in your hands and looking at it as if you were fishing with it. These visual aids built into the wrapping jig can help you get the alignment extremely close right from the beginning of the rod build. Number three, there's a convenient four spool thread carriage. This jig features a four spool thread carriage that can slide underneath the blank supports without disassembling the entire jig. As long as the thread is not threaded through the foremost guide on the carriage, you're free to move the thread carriage to any point along the entire length of the jig. This allows you to work closely to the blank supports and perform your thread work on either side of a blank support without any extra setup time. Number four is the spring steel constant thread tensioning rods. My jig includes two spring steel constant thread tensioning rods, one for each side of the four spool carriage. These tensioning rods enable you to back up several turns to correct a mistake without losing your thread tension, providing flexibility during the wrapping process. Number five, there's an improved jam nut knob setup. I've updated the design of my new wrapping jig. In my previous wrapping jig, I isolated the motion of the thread spool from the adjustment wing nut. The new jigs now utilize a jam nut knob setup that prevents your thread tension from increasing or decreasing while the jig is in use. The knobs are self-aligning and designed to level against the spool tensioning knob while jamming against it, which ensures it remains locked in place as the spool rotates. And I'll get more into that later on in the video when I go over the thread carriage. Number six is the adjustable elastic blank hold downs. The rod blank supports feature several adjustment notches in the elastic blank hold downs, allowing you to customize how tightly the rod blank is held in place. It's important to find the right balance of friction to prevent the rod from unwinding your thread wraps due to the tensioning rods wanting to spring back to their original shape while keeping the blank loose enough to easily rotate the rod blank by hand. The notches provide an easy way to adjust the tension on the rod blank to your preference. Number seven, there's a strong triangular framework built into this jig. The triangular shape formed by the three metal rods placed in the rail stands creates a sturdy and rigid framework for the jig. Triangles are known for their strength and are commonly used in construction where stability is crucial. The inverted triangle shape here also provides ample space for large guides to rotate freely due to the spread between the top two metal rods. This design improvement also allows the overall height of the jig to be slightly shorter than my original models while also allowing the thread carriage 
to slide below the blank supports. Number eight, it's lightweight, portable, and easy to use. The jigs are designed to be lightweight, highly portable, and easy to store away when not in use. Their compact nature allows for convenient transportation and storage, making them ideal for people on the go who want to bring their rod building jig with them. The final thing that I wanted to tell you about is I optimize the contact angle between the thread and the rod blank. One aspect I carefully considered while designing the jig is the angle at which the thread contacts the rod blank. In my previous jigs, I realized that it was more challenging to see precisely where the thread was laid down on the blank from a standing position. I built it to work best from a seated position and that was something I didn't think about until really a couple of years later. To address that in this new jig, I made a deliberate effort to ensure that the angle of contact between the thread and the blank is equally visible and accessible from both a seated and a standing position. I understand that some rod builders prefer sitting while wrapping their rods and others prefer to stand. By making the point of contact easily visible regardless of the position, I aim to provide a more convenient experience for everybody. Now let's talk about some tips for the assembly of the hand wrapper. I'll start out with the one half inch EMT conduit. Before purchasing your conduit, it's important to ensure its quality. Lay the conduit on the floor of the home improvement or hardware store and roll it from side to side. While some wobble is normal for the 10 foot long pieces especially, you want them to be relatively straight. They don't have to be perfect, but if a piece wobbles significantly while rolling it, it's better to look for a straighter one. Additionally, when selecting your conduit, pay attention to the amount of zinc buildup on it. Some pieces may have excess galvanizing and appear gritty or lumpy. While you can remove that excess galvanizing by sanding it off, it's preferable to find a piece that has minimal work needed to be done to it. In my experience, the ideal length for this wrapper is 7 feet or less. While it's possible to have a 10 foot long hand wrapper, there is some flex in the conduit at that length. Shorter wrappers will offer more rigidity. It's worth noting that a 10 foot long wrapper, the weight of the conduit can cause slight sagging. With a 10 foot long wrapper, you may need to lift the top two rails slightly in order to slide the thread carriage under the blank supports. I recommend that you purchase additional rod blank supports as you extend the length of your wrapper base. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to have a six foot long hand wrapper and only the two blank supports the jig kit comes with. With a six foot long wrapper, you'd probably want a minimum of four blank supports, which means that you'd want to purchase at least two additional blank supports in addition to the jig kit itself. These blank supports help stiffen the top rails, although some rails may still sag on wrappers that are over seven feet long. Just for reference, as far as size goes, the wrapper setup in most of this video is set at 28 inches long. That's suitable for building most multi-piece rods. Personally, I purchased three 10 foot long pieces of EMT and cut them down into seven foot and three foot pieces. This way I have rails to set up my jig at either three feet long or seven feet long depending on what type of rod I'm building. When it comes to cutting the conduit to length, I prefer to use a tubing cutter. It leaves the outside of the conduit smooth. However, if you have kids around who might inspect your work from time to time, you may want to deburr the inside of the tubing to avoid any cuts if they put their fingers inside the tubes. Alternatively, hacksaws, cutoff wheels, metal cutting band saws, there's a lot of different kinds of tools that you can use that will cut conduit pretty easily. Lastly, I clean the conduit to remove any excess oil, zinc, or sticker residue. I find it convenient to do this at my kitchen sink using water and dish soap and a stainless steel dish scrubber. The scrubber's abrasiveness makes quick work of any of the small bits of zinc spatter from galvanizing or sticker residue on the conduit. After cleaning, I simply rinse and dry it to finish up. To assemble the jig, slide the metal rail that the thread carriage rides on into the front side bushing on the thread carriage. Next, set the thread carriage and its rail on your work surface and slide the rail supports into place on each end. The rail that the thread carriage rides on goes into the lower middle position of the rail supports. Push the rail down until it snaps into place on the rail support.
Once you have your rail support on both ends of the thread carriage rail, you will install the top two rails on the rail supports by pushing them down into place just like we did with the thread carriage rail. Now we'll need to install the blank supports. The blank supports work the easiest if you install the back side first. The back side will be the side that's furthest away from you if you're sitting in front of the jig. The little fingers that grab onto the bar, ones that go to the back side, are turned facing away from the front side. The front side faces downward. The reason I designed these this way is because they lock those top two rails better and give it more rigidity than you get if you just had them both pointed down so the design made sense it worked a lot better so if you put the back ones on first then rock the blank support down and then push down to lock the front side into place you'll also notice that i moved the blank supports around while the front side is disengaged from the rail it slides a whole lot easier when it's not locked into position once you lock that front side down it pretty much locks that blank support into place it's it's a lot harder to move it once that front side's locked down so it pretty much locks the blank supports into position as well as adding some strength and rigidity to those top two rails. What you see here is optional. I like to put little thin rubber sheets under the rail supports. It just keeps it from sliding around while I'm working. I picked these up in a plumbing section at either Lowe's or Home Depot. They're called uh, rubber packing sheets that you can find in the plumbing department. I think they're a dollar a piece or something like that. The thinner it is, the better. That way you're not really changing the angle of your thread carriage a whole lot. These sheets are about a sixteenth of an inch thick. I think you could probably go up to a quarter of an inch and, and be fine. But just something under those to keep them from sliding around if you find that you need it. That's something to keep in mind. Just a quick note, you don't necessarily have to have all three of your rods the same length. Just as an example here, I've got the top two rails are seven foot long. The bottom one is six foot long. And the reason you might wanna do that is it gives you one rod that's a little bit shorter that might help you out with storage or something like that. But the main thing is, is I don't really need that extra length because the table I work on is not seven foot long. And most of the rods I build have a fairly long handle section where there is no thread work. So I can let that side hang over the side of the table and it wouldn't hurt anything for that thread carriage rail to be longer but it's just not necessary. I just wanted to show that you don't necessarily have to have all three rails the same length and you don't necessarily have to have them positioned at the end of the rails either. Just something to keep in mind if you're trying to figure out how you want to lay yours out. You have some options there on how you want to set that up. And that's really all there is to it. To take this back apart for storage, if you need to do that, you just reverse the assembly instructions and that's how you get everything back apart again. The rail supports are pretty simple. There's just three spots where your rails will go and lock into place. They have little fingers on them that are slightly smaller in diameter than the EMT conduit. So when you push the EMT into place, it will spread those fingers out and those fingers will grip tightly on the conduit, keep it from sliding back and forth. There's two of the rail stands that come with each jig kit and they will go towards the ends of your metal rails. The rod blank supports are a little more complicated. The fingers that grip the rails are turned 90 degrees apart from each other. And the reason for that is because it locks the supports into position on those rails more tightly. Once they're locked into place, they don't really slide around unless you force them to. In order to slide them around, it's easier to disengage the front side off the front rail and tilt it back a little and, and then slide it on the back rail and then lock it back into place by pushing the front down into position on the rail again. There are four detents on each side of the blank support. Those detents are for positioning the elastic that's used to create a little friction on the rod blank in order to keep the wraps from unwinding due to the constant tensioning rods, the spring steel rods on the thread carriage. If there were no friction at all, those would just come unwound as the spring steel rods return 
to their normal position. But if you get a little friction there, it keeps that from happening. But you don't want to get too much friction or it's hard to turn the blank while you're wrapping your thread. So those detents give you a lot of flexibility in how much tension you put on the rod blank. The last thing worth mentioning on the rod blank supports is the thin line that goes down the center of them. That thin line is there to aid with guide alignment. You can turn your guides facing down and look through there and line up the blank supports the thin line there you can line all those up with each other then you should be able to look down and see your guides and make sure that they're positioned correctly it's just a visual aid to help along with the metal rod that runs down the center that the thread carriage moves on both of those can be used in conjunction with one another to provide a couple of different visual aids to aid with guide alignment the metal rail, you can look down on the rod from above to get an idea of, of how good your guide alignment is. The blank supports can aid from the side when you're looking at your guides to make sure that they're aligned properly that way as well. The thread carriage is really complicated. It doesn't look like much, but there's actually 63 individual pieces that make up one of these thread carriages, and that's a big part of how I spend my time when I make these jigs. They're actually 40 individual metal parts and 23 individual 3D printed parts. There's metal parts inside of 3D printed parts that you can't really see unless you look real closely. Even counting the parts is a little difficult. Seven of the 3D printed parts are actually solvent welded together to make up the body. Solvent welding uses a solvent that chemically melts the plastic and you push them together and clamp them together and then when the solvent evaporates it leaves one solid piece so the bond you get from solvent welding is much better than you would get with something like super glue or anything like that because it is actually the plastic has melted and refused together into a solid piece and i do that for strength purposes it's more complicated and time consuming, but it ends up producing a higher quality product. I've also 3D printed some of the parts of the main body in different orientations in order to help improve strength and rigidity as well. A lot of the parts are press fit together and then solvent welded on top of that. So it ends up being a pretty strong part. Uh, most people know that 3D printed parts aren't always the strongest, but there are ways to work around that. And I've tried to improve the strength and rigidity of this thread carriage, and it's pretty solid. <laughs> I don't think anybody will have any problems with it. Now, you might could take it and break it over your knee if you wanted to, but under normal use, you shouldn't have any problems with it. The only thing left to do now is to actually use it. I'm gonna show you how to install a spool and how to route the thread on the thread carriage. I'm gonna start out by removing the jam nut, and I will follow that by removing the tensioner nut. They're both the exact same knob, just the one against the spool I would call the tensioner. The one that goes against the tensioner to lock it in place, I would call the jam nut and you'll notice that they look a little wobbly while they're coming off of there that's actually intentional i left the opening where the metal nuts are inside of the plastic knobs a little loose that way there's some movement there so that the knobs can level their cells against the metal washers and the other knob can level itself against the tensioning nut to jam and lock it in place that way everything stays as even as possible there's not more pressure on one side or the other if it's cocked a little bit to the side the spool actually get sandwiched between two large metal washers and that's because the ends of the spool are not flat if you put the metal washers on both ends of the spool it will turn a lot more smoothly without the little ribs that are on the spools causing a problem. Once you get the spool on and then get the tensioning nut in place, you'll want to adjust your tension on your spool and you'll probably have to hold the tension nut because as you rotate the spool it will try to move the nut either tightening or loosening it depending on which direction you're turning the spool. So if you hold that nut while you check your tension you can make your adjustments and then you'll install the jam nut. When you install the jam nut you will hold the tensioning nut and tighten the jam nut against it. Just using your fingers you don't need any tools to do this but just get it finger tight on there so that the tensioning nut 
cannot rotate as the spool moves. I put my spools on so that the thread pulls off the bottom of the spool and I pull out plenty of thread and I will run the thread through the first guide that's in front of the spool and then the thread will run up through the tensioning rod back down through the guide that's in the middle of the thread carriage and then all the way out to the front guide at the front of the thread carriage. Now I'm going to start a wrap on this rod blank to show you how you properly adjust the friction on the elastic band that holds the rod blanks down onto the rod supports. As you can see here, when I let go of the rod blank, the wrap starts to unwind a little bit, and that's because the tensioning rod is pulling back against it, trying to pull thread off of the rod. I only want it to do that when I want it to do that, so I'm gonna adjust the tension on this elastic band and tighten it up just a little bit on one end and see if that corrects the problem. That seems to have done the trick. I just wanted to show that I didn't have to tighten it much. I moved it down one detent on one side of that elastic. That was enough to correct the problem. It's still loose enough on there where I don't have any problems turning it with my fingers, but it's tight enough that it won't unwind itself due to that tensioning rod. Now I'm just going to pull the thread to the side as if I made a mistake and show you how you can back up using the tensioning rod. As you can see here, I can back up several turns without having to wind any more thread on my spool. If I needed to go back even more, I could wind some thread back onto the spool by hand and then pull my tensioning rod back down and back it up some more and just keep repeating that process until you get back to the point where you made your mistake. One other point to note here is the angle at which you've got your thread carriage set up. You want your thread pulling against your wrap a little bit so you need a little bit of an angle on your thread carriage you want it slightly running behind where your wrap is currently and that will pull the thread back against itself and help you keep your wraps tighter the last point i want to make is when you're moving the thread carriage from side to side on the rail you can't really do that at the front where that front guide is you really need to, to be able to touch closer to the center of the thread carriage right around close to where the rail is that it rides on you need to touch it there to move it from side to side if you try to move it from the front where that front guide is it just wants to twist and get in a bind but if you get your hand back closer to where that rail is it'll slide right along that rail without any problems these hand wrapping jigs will be available on my shopify store there will be a link in the description of this video to that store you can purchase them there i do ask that you allow for five business days turnaround time i more than likely won't take five days to ship them out but if something goes wrong i just want to have that time built in there and expect it up front if something goes wrong and i need to reprint a part or or something happens or comes up and I can't make it to the post office. I just want that five day period there. More than likely I'll be able to get them out within a day or two. But if I just have people expect that up front, if something does happen, it won't be a surprise and it won't cause a problem. These will be shipping through United States Postal Service Priority Mail, so you should get them pretty quickly after I actually get them to the post office. As of right now, these are only going to ship in the United States. If something changes, I will let people know on my YouTube channel if I end up deciding to ship internationally. I'm not planning on it right now. It's really a hassle. I wish it wasn't, but it is. I know I sold a lot of my original jigs to people in other countries and I really appreciated it. I was doing that through eBay, but eBay takes such a huge chunk of what I make off of something. I couldn't really justify doing that anymore I decided to go th through Shopify so I hope y'all understand about that I, I wish I could ship them internationally just right now it's just not in the cards if something changes though I will be sure to let everyone know and I believe that's it uh, if y'all have any questions let me know in the comments below I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have and I'll talk to y'all later